Okay, everyone, I think we'll get started. Um, for those of you who um, have just joined us, I'm Melissa Bradley. I'm the Regional Manager for the CRC for Water Sensitive Cities, and I'm going to be the host for this webinar today. So thanks for joining us. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Paramount people. Um, they're the traditional custodians whose, uh, whose ancestral lands I join you from today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge their deep feeling of attachment and relationship of um, the Paramount people to country, and we respect and value their past and present and ongoing connection to the, the land and their cultural beliefs. Um, and I know you're joining us from all over Australia, so you might want to add to the chat um, which country you're meeting us from today. Um, so today we're going to hear from two practitioners who have applied their infused benefit cost analysis tool to their projects, and then we'll have a followed by a panel session where they'll be joined by um, our key research leaders, Dr. Sayed Iftikhar, um, leader of the IA Integrated Research Project 2 and developer of the value tool and, the, and related resources. And then Professor David Panel, um, who's the lead, leader of Work Package 3 in this research project, and he was the developer of the benefit cost analysis tool. Excellent. Thank you so much, Melissa. Perfect. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so, uh, like uh, Melissa said before, my name is Alex. Um, I work uh, for Urbaqua and do a little bit of uh, work for New Waterways. Um, I was asked to apply the, the, the benefit cost analysis tool to a project as a case to show people through New Waterways how it can be applied and how it can be integrated into the decision making process in, in water sensitive projects. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm an engineer and uh, it was an interesting exercise for me to try and use a tool that's, uh, you know, focused on on the economics of a project uh, from my relatively simple background in that in that space. So uh, uh, I guess I'm a pretty good test dummy uh, for applying it in that in that manner. Um, so we we tried to look for a project that um, that was going to be suitable to apply the tool to one that made sense and one that had a couple of options so that we could explore how the tool is applied. Um, the project that we came up with uh, to use was a project based in the city of Mandurah. Uh, it's a project that's actually already been completed. Uh, so the, the BCA was applied retrospectively more as a, uh, as a way of, of looking at how the tools applied rather than um, actually using it at the decision point uh, in the project itself. Uh, so the project that that I chose to to use it on was uh, is located in the city of Mandurah, which is for people who aren't West Australian based. It's about 70 k south of of Perth. Um, the area is the area south of the Dawesville Channel there in that map. Um, basically, after the early 2000s, they uh, the city of Mandurah noticed that the population was increasing quite significantly. Um, particularly in the, the back half of the noughties, it increased by 70%. Uh, and they identified that there wasn't any active reserves, no public open space that could be used for sporting facilities or you know, active recreation. Um, so it became a priority to the city to find uh, an area where they could um, create public open space for uh, the, 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 the people that live south of the Dawesville Channel. Um, there was an area identified next to the Ocean Road Primary School. Uh, that uh, bit where I've got the red box there, uh, this, is, this is an aerial that's actually taken after the project was completed, which isn't particularly helpful. Um, but that area was sort of remnant bushland, not um, ecologically significant, but um, a bit of un, um, manicured, un sort of maintained land that uh, was next to the primary school. The bit of oval to the to the west of that was a, a much smaller bit of grassed area for the primary school itself. Uh, and the city sort of recognised that piece of land as, as an area that could be cleared, the oval could be expanded and sports rooms could be added on and, and facilities and parking and all the rest to, um, to make it uh, accessible for the wider community. Um, and the school, the Ocean Road Primary School itself is located right next to uh, the St. Damien's Catholic Primary School as well, which plays into the project. So the, um, 
the big limiting issue in getting this project over the line was finding a water source that could be used to irrigate the POS uh, and maintain it throughout the year because water is a, a big issue here in, in Perth. We don't, and WA, we don't have a lot of it sort of ready to go. So we had to identify a water source that was sustainable and affordable for uh, the, the expansion of the Ocean Road Oval. So the, the project that we applied the BCA to was specifically the finding a, a water source for the irrigation of the oval. So this is where it gets a little bit uh, confusing, I think, with the way that, that I applied it. Um, we isolated the water supply element of the project and applied the BCA to that. So um, yeah, that's the project. So the Oh, I've already covered it here. There are a few um, options that were to be that we that were looked at for uh, as a as a water source. The obvious one is scheme water, um, but the it doesn't really fit the the city's water sensitive um, mission statement, and they um, it wasn't really considered a feasible ongoing water supply for the project. Um, groundwater was looked at, but it was determined to not be feasible because of uh, over allocation of the aquifers in the area. And there was some issues with um, coning and saltwater intrusion that were occurring because it's located really close to the ocean. Um, so the, the sort of the main water sources that were looked at uh, in the, that we looked at in the BCA were uh, desalination, a small dedicated desalination plant that could be uh, installed nearby to the oval and fed in the water then piped to the, to the oval and irrigated that way. Um, wastewater reuse, a tertiary sort of system was looked at, but straight away that was considered to be way too expensive. And then the last one, which is a little bit obscure, was um, synthetic turf, maybe looking at whether or not using a turf that didn't require as much water might be a way to go. Uh, so there were a few assumptions that I had to make when applying the BCA. Uh, the first one, I think is important because the project organization is the city of Mandurah. Um, the initial capital costs of the project were going to be covered by a royalties for regions grant um, because that was the that was what it was eligible for and, and it was the only way really to get the project over the line. Um, all of the ongoing operational costs are going to be covered by the city of Mandurah because it's their asset. Um, they have to cover the costs. Uh, and then I had to sort of quantify the water requirements that we're going to that that we're going to be ongoing to irrigate the oval, so that then that could be uh, you know, in, inserted into the tool to work out what the benefits and the costs were actually going to be to quantify it. Uh, so during the first year, when given if there was turf like that required irrigation, so not the synthetic turf turf option, the other two, um, there was going to be between thirty thousand and forty two thousand kilolitres required in that first year. And that changes because uh, the final sort of, uh, I guess, element to the project was that if the water supply was going to be cheaper than scheme water for the neighboring St. Damien's primary, they were gonna contribute uh, some funding to the project and then, um, and then use that as their water supply for their green areas ongoing. So that sort of added an extra benefit to the project. Uh, the ongoing water supply would be between 24,000 and 37,000 kilolitres per year. Um, again, depending on whether or not St. Damien's got on board. And uh, I've got the three scenarios coming up, but the last assumption was that St. Damien's would only be involved under the third scenario. So I guess this is where um, I spent a fair bit of time trying to work out how to fill out the BCA with all three scenarios at the same time. And I got a bit stuck there because I'm not an economist and I hadn't used the tool before. I was trying to work out the way to do it, which is when I then went to the online base camp um, forum and asked for a bit of help. And one of the things that was pointed out to me very early on was that the way to do it and to, to, um, to actually use the BCA to assess the projects and the options was that I'd have to do it multiple times for each different water source option. Uh, and then in order to compare different 
scenarios, I had to have a baseline scenario that was then comparable to all three of the options. Um, so the without project scenario and the with project scenarios became really important to clearly define. Um, so we went with the without project scenario being that the development goes ahead, the oval is expanded, and then on the ongoing water source will be from uh, the water corpse scheme water. Um, this is a bit of a strange decision because it's not technically feasible because it wasn't really an option that could be considered uh, because uh, it, they just didn't have the water there and um, it didn't fit the, the sort of mission and the goals of, of uh, the city of Mandurah. But I needed a datum to compare the other three to. So this is what we went for and then estimated that the water supply would cost 220 per kilolitre and, and then use the numbers that way. So the first scenario was uh, the dedicated desalination plant, which is, I guess, a nice idea, but it's also one that requires a lot of uh, ongoing maintenance and operational costs, as well as quite a significant upfront capital cost, uh, which isn't associated with the other options. So the, the main costs for the desalination plant were the capital costs, which involved building a small desal plant, finding the land where it was going to go, you know, what's involved with preparing the land, clearing any, any trees or bush that needed to be cleared. And then the costs associated with actually connecting it to Western power and getting the power supply there. Um, and then the operational costs were worked out based on basic maintenance and power uh, and then disposal of all the waste. So the numbers there are, you know, it was about just under a million dollars was the estimate for the capital costs. $100,000 connection fee to Western Power, and then around 100000 per annum as an operational cost. But the benefits then were that it was a reliable source of water, that it wasn't likely to uh, you know, disappear or, or go offline. Um, and then the, the saving there and the benefit that was quantified was that it, you wouldn't be spending 220 per litre on, um, on scheme water. So that's where those numbers come from. Uh, the second scenario was the synthetic turf. Um, it, the first big expense of the turf was obviously purchasing the turf, which is quite expensive. I think we, it was the number that we've got there is about one and a half million dollars just purely to buy the turf. And then um, it has to be replaced every six to eight years. And um, one of the things that I guess wasn't, I didn't consider early on is you actually still have a water requirement for synthetic turf because it, it gets really hot in the sun and um, it needs to be cooled before it's used. Um, the benefits there were lower water usage, which didn't turn out to be as much lower as I think I initially thought. Um, and then that's the same benefit, which carries across all of the scenarios really, because it's the avoidance of that scheme water expenditure. And the last uh, scenario was uh, it, I guess it's technically groundwater, but it was groundwater that was related to this uh, wastewater treatment plant that was located about a kilometre north of the, the oval expansion area. Um, and the project, uh, well, that scenario involved installing five uh, abstraction bores just downstream of a wastewater treatment plant that um, had a managed aquifer recharge program associated with it. Um, and the water then would be abstracted the, the treated wastewater is then, it seeps into the ground, into the aquifer, and then these abstraction bores would abstract it 30 metres or so downstream. And then infrastructure would be installed to carry the water down to the oval, storage tanks on the oval, and then uh, this scenario connects to the St. Damien's Primary School as well. So they would be on board with the project. Um, so there was a couple of extra costs associated with this one because there had to be a feasibility study done to look at whether or not the water was suitable and meet, met the, the standards and the, um, the regulations for uh, health because it's a uh, recreational area. Um, and then there was capital costs that were around installing the balls and um, installing the, the tanks and connecting to the St. Damien's primary and piping it all down from the, the treatment plant. Um, there was an operational cost associated as well because pumps would have to be installed to actually move the water from the treatment plant down to the oval. 
Uh, the benefits again with this one were that it was sustainable. I mean, realistically, it, it, it's going to be available for a long time with a bit more sort of confidence than your typical groundwater aquifer. Um, and then the same benefits again, which carry across all the scenarios were that you avoid paying that money for the scheme water. Um, so once I entered it all into the BCA tool, the numbers didn't, <laughs> they look a bit grim. There's a lot of um, big negative numbers, but uh, it became pretty clear straight away that the managed aquifer recharge option was the one that had, uh, well, it's the only one with a positive net present value and uh, a BCR above one. So none of these look particularly good, but um, I think it's worth keeping in mind that the project this project because it's a local government project and because it's about providing amenity to the community it's not all about um, big profits so these numbers were never going to look um, huge but uh, it was pretty clear straight away that the managed aquifer recharge was the option to go with um, I guess my experience in applying the tool was was really good I thought that it was laid out really clearly every step had plenty of help associated with it and as someone who doesn't deal in the space a lot i found it really accessible and quite easy to use once i had overcome that issue of working out that the with project and without project scenarios were the key issue identifying them clearly was the best way to go and i also found that um uh, the the online forum the base camp people were really quick to respond when I had questions and, and it was really, really easy to get help. Um, but I guess I found that there was a fair bit of interpretation in, in how I could apply it and trying to consider all of the costs and the benefits, um, particularly some of the stuff around non-market values took a little bit of interpretation and a little bit of finesse, but um, yeah, I found it, I found it very, very efficient and very easy to use. Um, I guess that was all I had on the on that one. If anybody has any questions, great. Thank, thanks a lot, Alex. Um, I, I've actually had the luxury of seeing your case study in draft form, so I'm really um, appreciated seeing it applied in this way to compare one project against another. I thought it was really useful. But yes, rooking state with or without project, getting it right is um, yeah. that is <laughs> going to be a challenge for all of us because we we tried it and did the did, uh, had a few challenges. I've um, got a question here, um, just more about clarification because your language, your WA language, um, scheme water. If you could explain what scheme water is for everyone. Oh, sorry, that's my bad. I'm WA born bred. I don't know what's going on in the rest of the country. Um, the scheme water, the integrated, uh, what is it? I integrated scheme water supply is just the water corp. Is this name for the um, online? water supply system that the Water Corporation here in WA has established. It's a mixture between, uh, I think we're about 40% desal and 40% groundwater, and the rest is made up from the dams. It's just our, they're right. our main utility. Yeah, it's mains water. Great, okay. And then um, there was just a question, this is sort of more about it, um, overall. Could you explain why stormwater wasn't considered as an option, someone's asked? Um, I guess supply, the, the rainfall, in WA, the issue is always that most of our stormwater falls in winter, but the big requirements are in um, in summer, and we just don't have that annual. Um, we don't have the spread. The, the the way it's spread out doesn't really work. Plus, you then need somewhere to store it. Um, I'm sure it's an option that could have been looked at, but it's not one that um, that the city of Mandurah looked at at the time. So, um, I did sort of make the decision to only apply the BCA to the ones that I knew they'd actually looked at because they had a fair bit more. Uh, information and they've done a bit more work on the costing um, of okay. it all. Uh, okay, so the next couple of questions are more about the tool, Alex. Um, mm -hmm. I've got a question saying, did you use the tool to quantify non-financial benefits? Yeah, so this was, that was one that I was really, cause I tried really to implement elements of the value tool in as well, because I think the, the real appeal of the system is being able to incorporate those non-market values in, or the, the ones that aren't immediately obvious into the, the BCA. But I had trouble finding one, uh, any, any parameters within the value tool that really fit this project. Um, I think if you had applied the BCA to the project as a whole and included the, 
uh, the actual costs to create the, 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 the rooms for the teams and the car parks and the, um, the benefits directly to the schools. You could have found ways to incorporate it, but because it, it, the, the scale of the BCA and the complexity just exploded exponentially once I tried to incorporate the larger scale project, it sort of was out of my, I think, capabilities. But in terms of just the water supply, in, uh, imply it to that I, I couldn't find myself any ways to incorporate non-market values specifically into this one. I'm sure that there would be some creative ways of doing it, but I, I couldn't do it myself. So from what, from what you're saying, can I gather that um, had you had more time and experience, um, some of those um, net present values actually might have been a little bit higher because you would have been bringing some of those other intangible benefits, do you think? Like, yeah, I think so. I mean, I had a pretty solid go at fitting in non-market values and I, I I couldn't find any that were immediately obvious. I don't know if there's maybe something around like a willingness to, uh, for people that are using the facilities, maybe a willingness to increase water bills because of that comfort of knowing that it's a sustainable water source. There might be something in that. Um, I don't know if any of the research papers in the values tool covered that specifically. Um, yeah, but I mean, it would it would have been great to include non-market values. There might be something, another base camp test. Can I comment on that just briefly? Yes. I, I think that depends a lot on the baseline that you defined because, yeah. because your baseline was defined as the project would go ahead, mm. even if, you know, the, 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 the using scheme water, using mains water, um, then a lot of the non-market values would have been generated anyway, even yeah. in the baseline. So, so you wouldn't want to, you know, you wouldn't count them as an additional benefit of your, the projects that you're evaluating, except the ones that you just sort of pointed to there where um, uh, maybe there will be some benefits that people gain from knowing that they were more sustainable sources, right? So mm -hmm. maybe there's something in that. You could have potentially defined a different baseline, which was the project doesn't go ahead at all with, without, yeah. without one of these three new projects. And then you would have needed to bring in all of the additional benefits that the projects generated, but also all the additional costs, right? Yeah. You would have had to then bring in the cost of the whole project, not just the cost of the water. So getting, yeah. as you've highlighted, this, this issue of getting the with project and without project defined clearly and then sticking to that is really critical. Yeah, I mean, it changes the outcome really dramatically because a lot of the benefits that are sort of really intrinsically associated with this project were the benefits that came with the amenity of the, the open space because the BCA and the way I applied it isolated the water supply, all those benefits from amenity are lost, but also so are the costs of- well, well, they, In a sense, I mean, they're not lost, they're still picked up, they're still captured by the project, but you have decided not to evaluate them. You well, know, they, yeah, they don't- You've done a more focused evaluation. With and without. That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, just to clarify for people who aren't familiar with the tool, Alex, um, you provided in your um, presentation that it was that the overall benefit and then the project, project organisation benefit. Yes. Can you explain that for new users, please? Yeah, so the, um, the project organisation in this case was the city of Mandurah. Um, so because, I mean, they, it's their asset in the end, so they became the, the focus. But then the overall project uh, that included all the other stakeholders, which in this case were the stakeholders associated with the royalties for regions scheme, which were um, you know, the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development, um, the Peel Development Commission, which is uh, associated with the area, and a couple of other smaller donors as well. Um, and because they, they cop the upfront capital cost and then don't really directly get the, the benefits, um, the project overall, I, the, the numbers kind of look a bit frightening, but I think looking at the, the costs and the benefits for the project organization in this case um, is, the, is the focus because the money associated with royalties for regions is, is there to be spent. Those, they're not looking, I guess, those um, stakeholders aren't necessarily looking for that direct benefit in return. Um, so in this case, looking at the, pro, the cost and the benefits for Mandurah was the focus of, of the application. And the tool, from what I'm saying, the tool it like enables you to attribute a proportion of the overall cost yeah. to particular stakeholders. 
yeah, it's really, it's really helpful. It's actually really easy to do as well. Um, in this third scenario, uh, I looked at the St. Damien's primary school getting on board with it as well. And then you could um, distribute the benefits as a ratio between the city of Mandurah and St. Damien's and this cost and the money that they would save on connecting to it. And it was super easy to do. It's really easy to add stakeholders in and to shift the costs and the benefits around. It's actually like, for someone that knows nothing about economics, it was really, really user friendly. It's quite impressive. Right, thank you. I'm just going to give you one more question, and then we'll. Okay, we've got a question. What is base camp? So before I've got a question for you, oh, base sorry. camp for everyone. Yeah, maybe you explain base camp. For uh, you're probably better to explain it. I just know that it's online. There's people that helped me. <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just a network of users um, set up by the CRC, and it's a it's a it's a platform basically where we can all share ideas and. A forum, basically, yeah. and Basecamp is just the software that we used to do it. Um, I've got one more technical question for you, Alex. Um, mm -hmm. Was there much uncertainty uncertainty in the capital cost estimates? Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, they yeah. were. So um, I guess given the, the magnitude of the costs that I was sort of dealing with, um, there was a little bit of, uh, I guess, estimation involved, but I was pretty comfortable in the way we were applying them uh, in the magnitude of them and that at least compared to each other they were roughly accurate um, and I guess because the point of this was to compare three different options rather than to look at what's it going to cost and specifically for uh, each individual one I guess the purpose was to make sure that the amounts were comparable or the, the comparisons between the different scenarios were reasonable and then sort of what that was what they were as actual monetary values probably was less important. Um, okay. I, I, I have to stress that like this was added, I did this as a retrospective application of the tool, the project had already been completed. Um, so it was more an exercise in showing how the tool can be applied. And um, because of that, obviously I wasn't, I don't think I was as rigorous with determining the, the actual operational costs and maintenance costs of some of the specific options. It was more about sort of getting those ballpark figures so that then I could compare the options and show how it's done. Right. Oh, well, I mean, look, it's thank you very much for, for actually trialing it and and, and um, being brave to share it with us. And you know, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Learnings. Um, so we might just hold it there. I'm sure we'll have more time for questions to be directed to Alex back in the panel. But right now, I think we might just switch over to Alex. Uh, to, sorry, you're Alex. To Celeste um, for her to be her presentation. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, no worries. Hi everyone. I'll um, take you over to Victoria. Everyone see that? Just to check. Yes, you're good at that. Awesome. Good. Okay, so um, I'm going to share with you a case study where I used the Infuse tool um, about a year ago actually with um, City of Melbourne who wanted to look at a stormwater harvesting scheme to replace potable water irrigation. Um, for Princess Park, which is a large park in the north of Melbourne. Um, and uh, God knows if we'd done that this year, um, maybe we'd have other non-market values to add because definitely parks in Victoria are getting a lot of use at the moment. <laughs> and yeah, I think the appreciation has grown during lockdown. So who knows, there might be some interesting studies on community value that, that come out soon. Um, I'm just going to take you a little bit around uh, the project, um, the process we went through, um, what results we came up with, and then some reflections and lessons learned. So a little bit about the proposal. Um, you can see here uh, the, the kind of green ring, that's Princess Park. It's a large, kind of classified as a regional park um, in inner North Melbourne, so it's in a fairly um, built up area. And the proposal was to stormwater harvest um, excess stormwater from um, Moody Ponds Creek, which is that little star um, would be the harvesting point and transfer that over to the park. You might real, um, wonder why we're skipping all the green space in between, um, but there's already a stormwater harvesting scheme that irrigates um, Royal Park, which has been in place for about 10 years. So this would be uh, a new scheme just for Princess Park. So City of Melbourne um, came to us and said they've already done a concept level investigation. So they already had costs done um, for the scheme, uh, but they're wondering whether to take that project through the next stage of detailed design. So typically, I guess at this stage, you would cost the project 
you might evaluate some of the benefits but not monetize them. So they had an estimate of how much water they could harvest, um, estimate of how much you know, stormwater treatment that would do, um, but they couldn't really make the business case internally as to whether to take that to the next stage of investigation. Um, so they're interested in getting a, a kind of quick economic appraisal to make that case internally within council. Um, so it would be to irrigate the park, which is currently irrigated already with potable water. So it would be um, effectively replacing some of that irrigation supply and also to irrigate major trees, which run alongside the major road that goes um, by the park, which is Royal Parade, some very old um, and heritage trees effectively that are important to Melbourne. So at this point, um, I guess council had a dilemma um, and that's why the, the infuse tool came about. Um, it seemed too early to do a full economic assessment. I think sometimes it seems like a lot to invest in that kind of economic investigation when you're not sure and you're just at this early stage um, of project investigation. And sometimes, I don't know, economists can seem a little bit um, scary, <laughs> I guess, to practitioners. So they just wanted something that was quick but easily um, understandable for their internal stakeholders to say, is this a goer or is it not? And I think Infuse is perfect for that situation. Um, also, I think Infuse is, is great because it allows um, practitioners to use it and to kind of unpack what can be seen as a bit of a dark art sometimes. Um, economists can be seen as magicians that allocate monetary values to things and um, often it's quite impenetrable, I'd say, in terms of how those things are worked out. So, the great thing about the Infuse process is that you can get everybody involved um, and allow them to understand the assumptions that go into that. But something that was important for us as well is to take the results from the Infuse process and really create a summary document um, that was very short and approachable rather than a very technical economic analysis. Um, so we came up with a process with City of Melbourne, which we've called um, the nutshell process, which is effectively how to do a preliminary economic assessment using Infuse at that preliminary stage where you've got some high level costs to work with and you just want a kind of a go, no go approach um, to economic analysis at that stage. So it's not something that um, is designed, I guess, to, um, you know, go to deep review. It's really just that quick analysis that will help you take the next steps. And once you get through detailed design, you may decide to do a more detailed economic analysis. So it's a four step process. Um, and I think it's important to say that this process was designed to be collaborative and it's not actually until step four that you actually use the, the benefit cost tool. Um, there's a lot of pre-work and thinking that needs to go into this. And that's where the collaborative elements are really important. So step one was uh, meeting with the City of Melbourne um, leaders in terms of who was leading the project, understanding what they wanted out of the um, comparison and what that kind of with and without case was that Alex mentioned. We then um, actually used the values tool at that point, which um, I'm sure the guys here will give you um, an overview of what's in that Infuse values tool, but it's effectively a, a huge spreadsheet database of different studies that have been done that you can call on that have monetary values for different kinds of benefits. So we reviewed that in advance of step three, which was a stakeholder workshop where we got people together to discuss it and really hone down on, on the benefits that could be used for this case study. Uh, and the final step was actually then conducting the benefit cost analysis using that tool um, and creating a four page business case summary, which the council could use internally to promote the benefits of the project. So I'll take you through those steps in a, a little bit more detail. Um, the reason that they wanted to do this economic evaluation was really because the project um, costs were quite high and they were having difficulty justifying it just on, I guess, a, a financial basis purely. They wanted to look more holistically at the social and environmental benefits um, that could come into play for a stormwater harvesting scheme, just like this. Um, I guess commonly stormwater harvesting schemes would be looked at as more of a, a money saving exercise. For example, would we save enough potable water to offset the cost? 
And on that basis, it wasn't stacking up. So they were interested in the broader benefits that they could trigger um, through this eco economic analysis. Um, and so the way that you do that, of course, is looking at non-market value, um, values and looking at a benefit transfer method to, to appraise those. Um, something that was really a uh, focus for City of Melbourne, which became quite interesting to the project, is how we think about the future, in particular climate change in the future. So we ended up framing a scenario for the future that thought about future droughts in particular. So Melbourne um, was hit very hard with the millennium drought and um, the trees along Royal Parade and across Melbourne um, and the open spaces had really suffered. Um, and council had really felt, um, felt the effects of having water restrictions in place. So trees died off um, and it takes a long time to reestablish those to get the same kind of canopy benefits. And they felt they really struggled with parks closing, becoming a safety hazard because they were too dry and hard. And for a regional asset like this park, that was a real issue. So we decided to test, I guess, a scenario where we have a future drought and we have water restrictions in place. Um, that was quite difficult to frame because, of course, we have no way of predicting exactly when a drought would occur. Um, but we did the analysis over a 50 year time frame. And we made the assumption that a drought, the same as the millennium drought, would reoccur um, in 2028 and would last for the same time, sorry, in 2032. And we did that on the basis that um, water restrictions may be in place then because based on water supply modeling for Melbourne, our current water resource portfolio um, may come to shortfall at 20, 2028. So we had a reasoning um, to assume that there may be water restrictions in place um, under a high climate change scenario in the future. So that was the test basis for the future, which was important for the analysis. Um, we then went into setting up the with and without project scenarios. And I can't stress how important these are to make the economic analysis make sense because we have to be very clear on what we're valuing relative to, to a base case or a without project case. Um, so we have those scenarios um, down the side there and, and both of those scenarios would play out differently depending on whether, you, whether you're in drought or you're not in drought. So we had years in the analysis when we weren't in drought and one drought period which lasted for six years. So without the project would assume would carry on irrigating with potable water and 100% of the demand was met. But during the drought, we assumed that the past would reoccur. The council would have to truck in recycled water, just enough to keep everything barely alive, which is what they did last time, because it was a very expensive exercise in that period. With the project, um, we would have a stormwater harvesting scheme in place, which during normal times without drought, we would still be able to meet 100% of the demand overall, but some of that would be through potable water top up. So we're only replacing around 80% of, um, of that with, with stormwater. And during drought, um, the potable water wouldn't be available. So we'd just drop to the, the stormwater supply, which was modeled during drought and only dropped a couple of percent in, re in reliability. Um, so that gave us a clear basis for the different scenarios over a time frame. The step two was using the values tool. So we reviewed that in detail now knowing the details of the project, looking for potential benefits that could be applied. Um, so the seven benefits that we ended up quantifying, I've got on the screen there. So we looked at potable water savings. So just the, the avoided cost to council of paying for potable water when you've got stormwater as effectively a, a free operational cost. Um, you've got reduction in stormwater pollutants entering the bay. So we value that as, as a nitrogen removal value. Um, you've got maintained recreation and amenity during drought. So in that drought period, we'll be able to irrigate the green spaces and the trees enough to keep them thriving. Um, and we've got a maintained cooling benefit during drought. And we also worked with council to look at some avoided costs that we could value. So the avoided cost of, of tree replacement, um, trucking water and safety checks, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So in the stakeholder, stakeholder workshop, we um, 
explain the Infuse tool to a group of about 10 people within um, council in a quite a lot of detail. We had a two hour workshop to run through everything and we ran through every possible benefit that we could think of to really test, um, is this applicable? And what assumptions do we need to, to make around that? Um, so this is just one of the examples. Um, and I think this is the equivalent of striking gold in, in um, economics terms. We actually found in the values database, um, some research that had been done in the neighboring council area. So about two kilometers away from this park, people had been surveyed about how much they'd be willing to pay to um, help promote st better stormwater management to ensure that both their parks were irrigated during dry summers and their trees were irrigated um, in, the same, in the same periods of drought. So exactly the case that we wanted to test. So this is very rare that you'd have such a close case study and being so such a perfect fit. So that allowed us to apply that with some confidence. If it was undertaken, say in Perth instead, you might wanna factor down, I guess, the value that you're applying, but because it was so local, um, it was perfect to apply here. So they said that they would pay $56 extra um, to per person, per user of that park. And because it's a regional park, it, it had quite a large catchment. Um, so we discussed all those assumptions with council and they gave us you know, robust figures for the users of the park um, and we were able to apply that. And we also discussed when that would be applied with and without during drought. Um, so that really helped at that point. We also looked at some bespoke avoided costs and City of Melbourne had some really detailed retrospective studies that done of the impact of the drought. So one of the things they did was they looked at what percentage of their trees had died as a result of the, of the drought um, taking place. And that gave us um, some really robust costs in terms of what it cost City of Melbourne not only to replace those trees, but the benefit that was lost because of the size of the tree that you're losing. So you're losing a large canopy tree and replacing it with a small canopy tree. We were able to value the, the benefits that that tree actually offered to the community and the difference in canopy size over a period of time. Um, we also had data on the avoided cost of trucked water, which was again based on real costs that they'd experienced in the past, and the avoided manpower costs of people going around nearly every second day to check the safety of um, parks and, and their hardness to see whether, um, whether you know, they could be played on. And that was a, a huge cost to council. The, the fourth um, step in the process was actually conducting the benefit cost analysis. Um, so we did that during using the Infuse tool. Um, so I've been trained in using Infuse and I've also worked in, in benefit cost analysis with economists before. So um, I was fairly confident in applying um, the template, um, but it still is you know, fairly easy to, to work through, particularly once you've done that groundwork to find the values and, and enter them in. And we took the values um, and laid them out into a, a fairly concise four page business um, case summary for council to use. So it's fairly non-technical. Um, it, it told them about the, the benefit value um, we'd used, how we calculated that, our confidence in the value, and who the beneficiary would be. So what organization will experience um, that benefit, whether it's the broader community or whether it's council itself. So we tried to be as transparent as possible in the business case. And the results um, overall um, showed a benefit cost ratio of 1.9 which was um, greatly improved, I guess, from the case of just looking at the, the pure financial benefits to council themselves in terms of potable water savings. Um, so you can see the breakdown of the, the benefits there and the updated version of Infuse allows you to extract that um, information really easily. So you can see what kind of benefits are contributing most to the business case and compare those to the costs. Um, we also, as um, Alex mentioned, allocated those benefits to the different organizations. Um, so we had City of Melbourne actually only had 20% of the share of the benefits, um, but they were able to you know, round out the business case by saying actually the local community and park users that we effectively represent will receive most of the benefits. 
um, and the broader Melbourne community. So those that enjoy um, Port Phillip Bay will benefit from reduced pollutant loads as well. So just to share a couple of um, reflections on using an infuse as a tool. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a simple platform for a non-economist practitioner to use, um, but it's important to, I guess, not stop at the spreadsheet, but to take those um, results and really present them in a way that's appropriate um, to the audience. So we put a lot of effort into not just presenting a spreadsheet, but um, creating a story, I guess, for stakeholders to present the business case in the round. Um, the values were extracted from the tool to create the graphs and the infographics that we've presented there so that the tool itself um, doesn't automatically create those, but it does give you the values to uh, allow you to do that. Um, and it was important to council because it effectively made the case for them to get further investment to take that project forward. Um, one ref reflection is, I guess, um, different audiences will be um, interested in different things. So some will want the detail in terms of, you know, what discount rate did you use, um, et cetera. Uh, did you do sensitivity analysis? We included all of that in the summary, um, but it wasn't front and set center, I guess. It was, it was there for completeness. Um, we also looked at adoption and risk. Um, but in this case, because it was council led, um, the risk was considered to be quite low. They had experience in delivering stormwater harvesting before. Um, and it wasn't reliant on any community take up or anything like that. Um, so yeah, and it was important to make sure stakeholders were aware of those assumptions um, to be transparent. It was also important to recognize that while we did pretty well, I think at um, monetizing quite a lot of values, we couldn't capture everything. And that was important to present as part of the business case as well, that there are other benefits and council um, highlighted a few of those, which we also wrote about, but didn't monetize. So those were avoided closure of sporting grounds. So they did have sports clubs effectively closing as a result of the drought. Um, there's a the maintained mental health benefits, which are obviously very topical at the moment. Um, we didn't uh, monetize those. Um, improved soil condition. Um, someone from council has experience of soils actually getting better if you use stormwater rather than potable water. Um, and reducing um, downstream flood risk may have been something that was ben a benefit um, that we couldn't quantify at the time. Um, and the final reflection I think is that um, while the tool is a spreadsheet, um, it's not something to be done alone. Um, most of the work needs to be done through discussions before even opening the spreadsheet to really identify the costs and the benefits um, and discuss the kind of assumptions that you would put into that. It's important to take stakeholders on that journey um, so that everyone understands the analysis and its limitations um, and so that it doesn't become that kind of dark art of economics that it can. Um, and base camps being, being mentioned, um, but I think if you're using the tool for the first time, reach out to the community, call on the support for a review, because just like any other tool, it does take a little bit of getting used to. Um, and it's important to, to get that review so it's an ongoing learning process. And I think that's me, happy to take questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Celeste. Uh, just got one that's come in for you. Um, maybe if you, you might want to go back to your one of your slides, it says, um, was the reliability during the drought at 77% calculated based on a daily, weekly or monthly water balance? Um, I thought it was a, a very generous um, result, I guess, is what the suggestion is. So are you able to shed any light on that? Yeah, sure. Um, and we, we actually didn't do that analysis. It was done as part of the concept design, but um, it was a very detailed analysis. I think it was daily. Uh, in, and it looked at yeah historical rainfall patterns over the millennium drought itself and because we're at a bottom of bottom, bottom of a large catchment here um the reliability was quite strong and the proposal was actually also to harvest directly from moon ponds creek rather than from a piped network with a more limited catchment um so yeah they were quite confident that the reliability wouldn't drop that much great okay. um, also a very large storage that we're building sorry i forgot that but <laughs> okay. I've got another one here for you. Um, 
it says here, Celeste, would you, could you please expand on how the sensitivity tests are set up within the tool and, and how the pr uh, parameters are chosen for testing? Sure. Um, so there's a sensitivity tab um, within the tool and effectively it, it wants to test various inputs. So you could test, for example, your discount rate assumption, or you can test whether you take different benefits out, whether that will make a huge difference um, to, to the results. So whether it's over-reliant on one of the values or the assumptions that you've made. Um, I'm sure David or Sayed can probably add to that explanation, but we were able to get a range um, of, of the, from the sensitivity in the in the tool. Um, the next, next question I really like because I was thinking the same thing. Um, so for your engagement workshop stage before you use the tool, um, is there a framework that you use for, to inform that process? Because I think, um, you know, obviously that's fundamental to getting it right and I think if you've got any guidance of people on, on um, the process that you use the framework, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. I think, um, firstly, uh, I mean, our first exercise was really to strongly define that with and without scenario. I think that's got to be the, the first place to start. Um, and there was quite a lot of discussion about what would happen if another drought occurred, um, how much would we irrigate, how much potable would be available, those kind of things. And um, that's got to be really clear. Um, we then systematically went through each benefit we could think about and we've done the background research from the values tool to say we can apply this benefit this one looks a bit funny what do you think about it what assumptions can we make and then council also had a whole lot of ideas themselves on what benefits they could attribute so those ones that were very council specific they had the cost data from the last um, drought um, all came from that internal workshop right yeah and you are engagement is really key isn't it i've um, got a couple of other questions here for you um, were there any disbenefits associated with less flow in the creek? Is the question. Um, because it's a very urbanised creek, um, no. Um, I think if, if you were looking at a, a maybe a more rural situation or um, further upstream, then yes, but we're, we're right at the bottom of, of the catchment here. Um, and yeah, the urbanised flows are a large portion of it. Great. Yeah, so that, yeah, there would have already been excess flows in that creek. Yeah. Yep. Okay, here's, here's a bit of a technical question for you. Did you consider giving <laughs> the marginal cost of potable water rather than the retail cost to the council as the avoided cost? Uh, yes, we did actually use the long run marginal cost, um, which reflects the, the cost of potable water as a whole. Um, okay. So yes, that was actually used. That's excellent. Um, okay, so I, I believe I've exhausted the questions that have come through the chat. Oh, hang on. Good, oh, good, good presentation, Celeste. That's the big thumbs up. Um, what is the benefit cost ratio of the base case? And can you please expand on your two base cases and how they were used? Sure. Well, I guess we, we tested one scenario and that is effectively compared to the base case. So all the costs and benefits were, were marginal to that. So what the differences were in the costs and the difference were in the, ben in the, in the benefits, we didn't actually appraise the base case itself. Okay. All right. We might have a chat to Dave later about um, his, his reflection on that um, um, when, he, when he does his reflection on the, on the presentation. Um, so I think we'll just put one final question. Is there a way or does it make sense to include political support influence as part of the cost benefits? Oh, maybe is that, is that one for Dave as well? I don't know. Do you, do you want to have a go at that, Celeste, or should we defer that one to Dave? Um, well, I think if you're building a business case document, it doesn't necessarily have to go into the spreadsheet, but, you know, those kind of broader drivers can be recognised as part of a, a broader business case. It doesn't necessarily have to be a number attached to it. Yeah, good. Okay, so yeah, that quality, you can put that qualitative element into your, um, into your business case, that's right. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Celeste, and for sharing your story, and certainly interesting to see how you've broken up those benefits and, and sort of interrogated those, so that's, that's great. Um, might hand over nice. to Dave Panel. That's Dave Panel. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, thanks Melissa. Um, I'll just pick up the, the political influence or political concerns sort of issue briefly. So, I mean, philosophically, economists would like to present a set of sort of balanced, independent information that's not sort of coloured by political considerations, if possible. But 
and certainly not trying to build those into the benefit cost analysis, quantify them and monetize them. But I've certainly been involved in cases where there's been some political sensitivity and and I think, you know, we've handled it in the sort of way that Melissa sort of suggested, just just flagging it, making it explicit that this could be considered a risk and then leaving it to to the decision makers themselves as to what, what they want to do with that, rather than trying to put a money, a dollar value on it. Okay, well, I think um, Celeste and Alex have done a mighty job, really, in running through a whole set of practical and, um, and more sort of um, conceptual issues. Um, and so a lot of what I would have said has already been said. So I might just sort of reiterate a, a few things that I think are particularly important. Um, both of them, have, and, I, and, and I did as well, highlighted the, the critical role of being clear about defining the with project scenario and the without project scenario. Um, and just to jump to one of the questions, so there is no benefit cost ratio for or without project scenario because that's the baseline. It's, you know, you can't, you're comparing it to itself, you know, if you're trying to do that. So, so that's by definition, you wouldn't have a benefit cost ratio for the baseline. But the benefit cost ratio, as Celeste said, is relative to you know, changes away from the baseline. Um, I really liked Celeste's emphasis on the participation and transparency and involvement of stakeholders and conversations and the, the way that she identified that really there's quite a lot of thinking and talking to do before you get to actually putting numbers into a spreadsheet. It's really sort of the the, the last stage and that, and, and that, you know, that getting that clarity of thought and the best evidence that you can gather is really where most of the work is done. If you, if you've done all that well, then the just sticking numbers in the spreadsheets doesn't take you very long and it's pretty easy. Um, and as we've, as you've heard, the, the, the tool is pretty well designed so that it is easy. It's sort of relatively intuitive and particularly once you've had some experience, I'm sure if Alex did it a second time, he'd find it, you know, even, even more easy than he had the first go. Um, we've sort of got a bit of a picture of what the sources of information for a study like this might be. You might be wondering, how do you get the, 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 the data together? And I guess my sort of quick answer to that is, you try and find the best available information from wherever. Um, and sometimes that's really high quality information, like Celeste had um, data from the previous drought and could use that directly. It fitted pretty tightly to what she assumed would happen in her with project scenario or and, in, and her without project scenario. So that was great. But some uh, other times that sort of quality of data just isn't available. And Alex mentioned he was looking for a particular value and there just wasn't a value for that particular benefit in the in the value tool. Even, you know, there's 2,000 values in there, but sometimes you want something that's very specific and it just hasn't been studied. And that's there's nothing you can do about that other than uh, study it yourself, I suppose, or or make a, a an educated guess about it or leave it out. Um, Celeste mentioned a few things that they didn't monetize. I think she her study highlighted that the that this approach is really helpful when you have a project with multiple benefits, like they were able to capture, I think about eight or nine different types of benefits in their analysis and that, so that was great. Um, but there were a few others that they didn't monetize and that's fine too. In, with sufficient effort and time and expertise, all of those could have been monetized, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's more costly and the type of study that she was doing was like an initial look and see to guide, you know, like a, a stop go decision. So it probably wasn't worthwhile. And even in a case where you did have more time and it was a more thorough analysis, you wouldn't necessarily want to monetize everything. You, you might make a judgment that some benefits are just too small to be worth bothering with going to that extra effort. And in fact, there were a couple of, um, in her bar chart, there were a couple of the benefits that were just little sl thin slithers in the slivers in the, in the bar chart. And so and if you could anticipate that, then you wouldn't need to worry about monetizing those perhaps. Okay, so that was sort of my quick reflections on the key points that came through. I, I'm just gonna share my screen briefly to highlight a couple of other things. Okay, so let me. Right, so um, 
I, I was going to go through some of these points, but I don't think I need to. I think we've covered most of these, but I just, if you would like to sort of delve deeply, more deeply into some of the things that we've been talking about, or to get a handle on a few other sort of key points that we've identified from the case studies that have been done so far, we're, we're soon to be putting out a, a brief document which highlights nine sort of key things that we've found from all of the case studies that have been done so far. A lot of them we've been reviewing. Uh, we've also had Liz Peterson, a local Perth consultant, reviewing a bunch of the case studies that have been done. And we've been trying to sort of capture sort of the lessons that have emerged from, from those and a bunch of those we've just talked about. I'm not going to go through these now, but just to let you know that, that there's a document that does that that will become available on the project website before too long. I would just say thanks to you, Melissa. You've been the real one of the key driving forces in in us even having this project, and uh, so um, I'm really happy that you're really happy that we've delivered on what you wanted. I, I don't. I, we thought we were going to do it ourselves, and now I just think I'm so glad we didn't try. <laughs> I'm so glad we partnered with you. So, all right. Um, well, thanks everyone for attending, and um, yeah, keep 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 connected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye.